Have you seen these incredible new pictures of amazing coloured glass? These are the first close-up images from a brand new range of mouth-blown sheet glass and they're incredible. What's really mind-blowing is that they're the first experimental pieces made by award-winning international glass sculptor Elliot Walker, who's based at Blowfish Galleries in the glass city of Stourbridge here in the UK. Set up by fellow glass artist Bethany Wood, Blowfish Glass UK is a leading hybrid hot shop and contemporary glass gallery. Elliot leads a highly experienced team within the hot shop and together with Bethany collaborates with distinguished artists and corporations the likes of Disney Pixar and the V&A in London. By the way, if you like inspirational videos and tutorials all about stained glass, drop a like and follow for more. So, recently they opened their hot shop to around 30 fellow glass artists for a close-up demonstration of how this incredible glass is being made. It was organised by the Conservation Working Group of the British Society of Master Glass Painters to showcase what's possible when you get a master glass blower like Elliot to make your sheet glass. Narrated and presented by glass conservator Laura Aitkinson, with massive additional help from glass blower Maddie Hughes, let's watch this whole wild, mind blowing display unfold before our very eyes. It's definitely rock and roll. Um, hi everyone, so um, I'll introduce you to Elliot and Maddie, and I'm Laura. Um, Elliot and Maddie are mainly going to be doing the making, and I'm going to be trying to explain what they're doing as they're doing it, so you don't miss any of the, the detail. Laura is a conservator, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, stained glass conservator, but with a background in hot glass. And uh, I started off making, doing stained glass myself, and then I moved from that into the kiln room, and then from the kiln room into the hot shop. So it's sort of like a, a little progression, you know, where each stage it just gets warmer and warmer and warmer. <laughs> We're going to be making a cylinder glass, and the demo is going to be in two parts. The first part, we're actually going to make the cylinder, the blown part. And then the second part, we'll be using a pre-made cylinder from a previous session. And that's in the kiln over there. And then that's going to be opened up into a sheet. Tool. So we're not making stock sheets of, of glass for, you know, like Lambert's or, or English antique. It's, it's about bringing together sort of stained glass artists, glass blowers, and creating something really special, unique glass. But I mean, obviously there's a lot of overlap, but there's not a lot of communication between the two, um, the two areas really. You know, one person is making something for another person to use. But the, the really great thing about what we're trying to do is like opening that collaboration up. Bringing it back, I guess, to, to how it has been in the past. You know, we were looking at um, uh, a bunch of Tiffany windows where the glass was made specifically for different parts of the window, you know, and that sort of idea of collaboration and crossover is what we're sort of really interested in. Uh, the first demo that we did today was working with Grace Ason, and her piece of glass was based on this charcoal drawing. So you might think, oh, this is a very small piece of glass. Doesn't always go right. So this did end up on the floor. Um, yeah, it, it's quite dramatic. <laughs> I mean, there is a gap in the market, definitely, for sure. It's not a gap. It's not a specific gap that we're trying to fill here, though. I mean, you know, the, the gap in the market is someone to be producing stock sheet yeah. for people to buy. I mean, our studio here and the way we're working with Laura, it, it's we're not going to be produ mass producing loads and loads of sheet. But adding this technique to the repertoire of the studio is, is what we're sort of aiming for, for quite specific. It's really about working with artists to create something very special, very bespoke for for a certain project in mind, but also I think there's conservation applications. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, I'm coming from a conservation background, I can see where 
you're working on a project and you're thinking, I need this particular glass. This hasn't been made for however many years. It's never going to be made again. And what is fantastic is Elliot has got this huge variety in skills of being able to apply colour, texture, different techniques that your standard sheet glass maker hasn't got. So I think it's through that collaboration that we'll really be able to sort of create something quite special and that, that might be for artistic application, contemporary work, or it would be for a conservation application. So do you notice there, Elliot's just got his thumb, he's blown a bit of air in and put his thumb over the end of the blowing iron and sealed that end. That air is now warming up because of the heat in the iron and it's forced into that glass and inflating it ever so slightly. So just a thin layer of clear glass over the top and the excess has been put into that bucket, which looks like is about to have a hole in the side. We are also at the mercy of the, the colour manufacturers and they're having problems too, you know. It's not just in the stained glass world that you're having problems sort of getting materials. Um, it's also the colour manufacturers. So There are only two left now that are actually producing the colour and one of them is struggling, I kind of think. They've taken over another company and they're trying to combine the two. I mean, the, the variety of colour is, is pretty huge and then my sort of feeling in it is that by blending, and by overlaying yeah. and overlapping, you can be really, really specific in the tones and the quality of the colour that you get. Um, it'll be interesting the first time someone comes to us and says, I need to match this colour. Then we'll really know whether we can do it or not. But, you know, it's like there's so many options for it that, you know, we've got high hope. Yeah. So we're not actually making the colour, so the colours are all bought in, like a painter would buy in their paint. So we're not doing the chemistry to mix the colour ourselves. The skill comes from uh, the colour application, so the patterning that you're using, the overlaying, the amounts and thicknesses and densities of the colour that you use. I mean, we're using some colours which are basically the same density when they're in the bar form as when they're blown and we're using other colours which you need to use the tiniest amount to get a really dark shade. So that's where the skill comes into it and that's where the knowledge and experience of using these um, rod colours is, is vital for that sort of thing. This piece of equipment, that's called a soffietta. So it's a way of being able to introduce and inflate the piece with air without having a blowing iron attached. And then the next stage will be, Elliot will cut the, uh, the sealed end off and then put a slice, you know, cut down the length of it and then that will be opened up in the kiln. That is a section taken out. Because if you did a single cut and they're touching, as soon as you start heating it up, they're gonna fuse together. So you want that little bit of a gap to, to buy you some time while it's uh, flattening. In terms of like which ones are hard to use, I mean, red. red <laughs> yeah, red is just like really down. difficult, yeah. And it will just, yeah, strike out and, and... And you need to treat it in a completely different way. First way we were doing it was trying to do it sort of medieval style and doing it all in one, where you would actually, you know, create some broadsheet where you would make the cylinder and then cut it while it was still hot and open it up. Um, 
It gave some really lovely, undulating, lively glass, but it was really stressful and some of them would be quite chewed up. Um, so, yeah, try and go a bit more controlled. Yeah. The coppers, yeah. It's the coppers that seem to be... Copper ruby okay. is something that I, I don't think I've ever done a good copper ruby. It often goes opaque. Yeah. So that's copper ruby. That's how we like it. I mean, this is Bethany's work, so that's how she wants it to go, but that should be technically a transparent copper ruby. So it's it's very specific in the way you treat the colour. And also greens, you know, I mean, there's, there is sort of, I think for a stained glass conservator, there is basically an endless nuances in a green tint. And you can have a whole rack full of green tints and you still can't find the right one. <laughs> and it might be okay through transmitted light, but then you'll apply a bit of paint and it will look okay. But then you apply another color, very subtle, different paint, and it will just change the color of the glass because of what it's sitting you know, by, the color of the paint. So I think greens will be an interesting. I mean, the process itself, we're still, um, you know, we're still working uh, and experimenting with the process itself. I mean, there aren't many places that are doing this, as you say, you know, the last one in the UK is sort of finished up for now. You know, the secrets of the process are quite sort of vigorously guarded, which I don't think is a good thing at all, because it's not like we're trying to go into competition with people. We're trying to add to the whole, you know, to the scene itself. Um, the process, I mean, the reason why I like doing it is because it's so difficult. There's a lot of uh, failure and disappointment and stuff like that, but each time we do it, it gets a little bit better, it gets a little bit smoother. Some of this glass is actually made sort of eight years ago in a field with a mobile furnace, um, and I just thought I'd got to start using this stuff. And some of it was really thin, some of it's really thick, but it all cuts just beautifully, um, really, really nice. Fernando, would you mind being the beautiful assistant? <laughs> you might never have used those colours together before. Um, and there's a chemical reaction between the, the metals in that. And you just, I mean, it is amazing sometimes the, the combinations that you can get. Um, you know, working glass in a blown form to the specific thickness, that's a skill in itself, but that's something I've been doing for years. Breaking this thing open and trying to flop it out like, you know, like a wet eggshell or something without it cracking, it's like trying to de-shell an egg without breaking the shell. It's really, really, really tricky. <laughs> so then also, Eric, the thing is, you're, some, you're actually getting a bit too good at certain bits of it, where is. <laughs> as, as a sort of stained glass person, I want to see the kind of movement and the, the bubbles and the the happy accidents. Maybe yeah, the I mean, location of color. Totally. And I'm having to say to you, stop controlling. Still, still yeah. doing that quite so well. Then mm. can we mess this up a bit? I mean, the thing for me is, if I can, if it's it's like you know, abstract painting or something. If you can paint something really well and almost photorealism, that's the point where you start working backwards. You know, you, I don't feel, I'm not comfortable with the idea of doing something sort of organic and badly at the start no. and getting better. I need to get it bang on. I need to make the most perfect sheet and then start working in all of these irregular or so just it, stuff like it, that, you know. Do it right and yeah. do it the proper way and then you can start taking Doing it this way, especially the way we're working with a lot of colour and a lot of texture in the colour, it's never going to be this, you know, like Lambert style sheet. And that's not what we're yeah. trying to, I mean, there would be no point trying to replicate that because it's something which is already done. We need to do something different. We have the final sort of hurdle to get over, and that is when we're opening the sheets out, there's a specific material that the glass is folded out onto and I'm going to do a call out. If anyone knows what the hell this material is, we need to know. Because when you're folding the sheet out, the sheet's getting to like 700 degrees and it starts to mark on the underneath and it starts to stick to the shelves. We've tried different releases, graphite, ceramic, all sorts of different stuff. Different speeds. Different speeds, different temperatures. Higher. We need to know what this shelf material is that you can fold glass out onto, flatten it off, and it won't stick and it won't mark. 
That's the magic thing. That's the magic material. That's the magic material. And no one will tell us yet. <laughs> Come on, internet. Yeah, yeah. It has to be an answer. Yeah, there's yeah. gotta be, there's gotta be. But that's the final hurdle, really. After that, we're away. I mean, I just, you know, it'll be, yeah, it's it's such a weight off when we figure that out. Yeah. And we will, even if we have to develop a new thing. Yeah.